Hello, welcome to Raptor Talk. I'm Marites Vitug, and joining us from New York is journalist and author Ivan Ratliff. This is the latest book of Ivan Ratliff, it's entitled The Mastermind. It's a fascinating account of somebody we have never heard about in the Philippines, uh, Paul Leroux. He operated a, a criminal empire from Manila, uh, basically dealing with illicit drugs. And uh, in this, this is Paul Leroux, if you can see him here, it's a black and white photograph. But this is a product of uh, four years of work or more by Ivan Ratliff. Welcome to Raptor Talk, Ivan. Uh, can you tell us how did you get to know of this character of Paul Leroux? Well, the first time I heard of Paul Leroux or his business was actually in 2013, 2013. He had employed uh, a network of mercenaries, ex-U.S. military, South African military, Israeli military, British military soldiers to work as enforcers for his business in the Philippines and all over the world. So he hired these soldiers and uh, they were employed to intimidate people, to kill people um, for uh, owing Paul Leroux money, stealing money from Paul Leroux, deals that fell through. So one of those mercenaries was arrested uh, in a sting operation by the Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA here in the U.S., uh, and a very elaborate sting operation in Thailand. And that was the first kind of door that opened to seeing a little bit about Paul LaRue's business. But at the time, it was very mysterious. And it wasn't clear who Paul LaRue was, why he had hired these people, where he went. And so I started digging in to try to figure out uh, how he had built this whole empire and, and where he came from. Why did you become obsessed about him? I mean, the mercenary uh, lead uh, ended up with a drug empire uh, story. What, what made you follow him and write the book? Well, I found him to be a pretty fascinating character uh, to spend a lot of time uh, taking a look at, partly because he was a computer programmer by training. So he was actually born in Zimbabwe, in the 70s. He was raised in South Africa. He was a self-taught computer programmer who, if he had gone into the mainstream straight world of computer programming and technology, I feel, you know, we would be lauding him on the cover of magazines for his success in terms of what he built. But instead, he sort of used that knowledge and that ability to create this empire on the other side of the law that started with online pharmaceuticals that he was selling to the U.S. and then got eventually into all sorts of drugs and weapons and, uh, you know, a, a really vast criminal empire. And I was very intrigued with that evolution, how he had gone from being this very accomplished programmer to being a person making huge amounts of money living in the Philippines to a person who was engaged in every possible criminal activity, including violence and murder, how did that evolution happen? How did other people get involved with it? And so I wanted to sort of trace all those stories back to the to their origins. After reading your book, even I was so shocked that no one among the journalists in the Philippines or others have never heard of Paul Leroux. Why was he under the radar in, in the Philippines? Maybe you can talk about how he bribed everyone in this country? Well, there's a there's a couple of reasons. I mean, well, Rappler did not exist uh, at the time that he was at his height. So he was arrested in 2012. And uh, I think Rappler was actually started early in 2012. So maybe you would have reported on him <laughs> if he had been more active at that time. But there was actually some courageous reporting by journalists in the Philippines about parts of his business, like the Philippine Star would do stories about arrests of people that were related to him, but no one knew his name. So his name was actually really kept under the radar. That was intentional on his part. And there were a couple of ways he did it. One was technological. He would keep himself hidden behind layers of technology. He was running the whole operation from his laptop. He lived in Das Marinas. He lived in uh, Makati. He had condos and houses everywhere, but he was operating out 
essentially through his laptop. And the other reason was, as you say, corruption. So, you know, eventually here when he testified, one of the things he said was, I didn't care who knew what I was doing in the Philippines because I had the police on the payroll and no one could touch me. And it turned out that he was bribing officials all the way up to, you know, I think the level of generals, if not higher, to prevent there from being investigations into him. So I even talked to some PMP, you know, officers who started investigating LaRue and were told to stop because he had bought off people who were above them and they were instructed, you know, look somewhere else, don't spend any time on this. So he was able to operate for years because he had paid off the people who would look into them, look into him, you know, if they had the opportunity. And even if they arrested lower level people, he could always buy their way out of the trials, pay off judges, et cetera. And so he, even when he left the Philippines, he was still a sort of unknown quantity. There was even one uh, part of your book that talked about Lero bribing a senator of the Philippines. I that was one of the stories. <laughs> yes. I mean, it, it is, there, there were a lot of things that were hard to verify. Um, there were things that he told people in his organization that he had done, including bribing a senator, including bribing a relative of a very powerful person in the government and giving them a million dollars in cash in a bag. Um, that was one of his claims at one point. Um, so some of that's hard to verify, but I do know for sure that he was bribing officers in the PMP, that he had someone from the NBI, fr former NBI agent on his payroll that worked out of his office, whose, whose job was essentially to get them out of trouble. And so he was, distributing at least tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars, U.S. dollars, uh, in, in bribes to make sure that, that he could be untouched. Uh, you also mentioned in your book that uh, Leroux bought, bought a methamphetamine made in North Korea, which uh, was sold to him, I think, via a middleman. And was he selling to the Philippines and Southeast Asia or just the U.S. and Europe? His primary markets for those types of drugs, so methamphetamine and cocaine, were Southeast Asia. Not some in the Philippines, but I think predominantly the bigger markets for him were you know, Australia, Japan. Um, he, he was... I think he was trying to sell some in the Philippines, but I think the bigger markets were, were outside. And then he also had an online pharmaceutical business that was selling painkillers, and that was entirely in the U.S. So he was selling painkillers in the U.S., but more, uh, more dangerous drugs, depending on how you look at it, uh, he, was, he was focused on Southeast Asia as, as, as the market. Mm -hmm. Please describe the road to us. You've tried to understand him uh, how is he different from, you know, other drug kingpins like uh, the one in Mexico or Colombia? H how did he operate uh, so quietly? I mean, with it, without catching the attention of people. Well, I think one of the things that makes him so unique is that he created his own organization. So, if you look at a lot of the Mexican or South American, you know, drug dealers, drug cartels. Uh, that are sort of famous or pursued uh, by the U.S. in particular, a lot of them came up through an organization. So there was an existing organization or network of organizations. They sort of battled their way to the top of the organized crime pyramid. But LaRue did something different, which is in Manila, he invented his own cartel. Everything sprung from him. He was the person who came up with the ideas, who made the deals, who hired everyone. I mean, at one point, he had call centers and businesses. He was employing thousands of people, over a thousand people in the Philippines easily. So he was actually unique in that he created, out of nothing, a criminal organization that he ran entirely, it was entirely under his control. So I think that was part of it. And then I think his, his sort of technical ability was the other thing that made him unique. Because he was a computer programmer, because he understood the internet and he understood how to distribute his business all over the world, 
and protect himself from the authorities, then he had a sort of unique way of staying off the radar of of most authorities, although eventually, of course, he did, he did in fact, get caught. He was earning so much, uh, multi-million dollars, yet he ordered some of his people killed because he suspected them of stealing maybe just a thousand dollars. What do you make of this, Ivan? It's a, it's a hard thing. <laughs> it's a hard thing to make sense of, I think. Um, you know, there's lots of ways to explain it. Um, I don't know the psychological explanation. I think the closest <laughs> that I could come to understanding it is that he was, you know, operating his business almost in the manner of um, playing a video game, if you want to think of it that way. He was sitting at a computer and he was able to extend his influence all over the world, make a deal in Somalia, make a deal in Colombia, and eventually when he got into that world, he came to believe that part of being a big crime boss was intimidating people who might have stolen from you or skimmed a little money off. And so he got wrapped up in that world. Now some people would say he's a psychopath, he doesn't care about human life. I think that may also be true, possibly. But I think mostly he believed that this was part of the business that he was in and that if someone stole $1,000 from him, as you say, he had someone on his hit list, he was making hundreds of millions of dollars. He had someone on his hit list who had stolen, he thought had stolen $1,000 <laughs> from him. So he was operating in a very extreme environment when it came to violence and how he would use violence to try to enforce his his wishes. And I think he, he may have believed that was part of being, uh, you know, the ultimate crime boss, global crime boss. And uh, how did he form his team of mercenaries? You know, what's fascinating in your book is that uh, this men, group of men are ex, ex military and hang around on in P. Burgos Street in Makati, a red light district. I will never see P. Burgos the same way again. <laughs> I thought they were just there enjoying having fun. Uh, but how did he you know, form this uh, team of mercenaries? Well, in a way, it was surprising how, how easy it was. I, I think there are a lot of ex-military uh, people who are living in the Philippines who, especially in the early 2000s, they were living in the Philippines because it was more affordable and whatever other parts of the lifestyle that they they were interested in. It's beautiful. Um, it's warm. But also they were they were getting contracts to go work in Iraq and Afghanistan for, you know, in adjacency to the U.S. military. So they were working for these big security contractors. So there were a lot of people who were still very invested in the military lifestyle who were there. And then LaRue, when he met them, I and mean, he met in particular, uh, a man from the UK named Dave Smith, who hooked him into a whole network of these people. And it was a better lifestyle for them for to work for LaRue than it was to go to, say, Afghanistan and work in a more dangerous environment. For them, it was fun. It was exciting. He sent them all over the world to go buy gold or move gold or buy houses. And so that lifestyle was very appealing to them. He paid pretty well. He paid enough that it could they could live very well in the Philippines. And the alternative lifestyle for them was often security contracting in dangerous war zones. So there were a lot of people available. And I talked to many of them who just thought, OK, well, maybe this is a little illegal, but uh, it's better than my alternatives. Yeah. And uh, Leroux was arrested in 20, 2012, right? Yes. And he's been serving a uh, sentence in, in a prison in Brooklyn. Uh, what is the status of, of the case? Uh, has there been a deal with a U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency? Yes. So when, when he was arrested in 2012, he did make a deal with the DEA and the, and the prosecutors, really, here in New York City, uh, where he agreed to cooperate. And as part of that cooperation, he helped catch some of the mercenaries who had worked for him. He helped catch some of the drug dealers, including the middlemen to North Korea, who had helped buy methamphetamine out of North Korea. 
And he's been in custody that whole time, operating from inside U.S. custody, but sort of for a number of years pretending to still be at large. So pretending to still be out there, still emailing people, still getting them involved in deals and organizing these operations that eventually became sting operations for the DEA. And now he's about to be sentenced. So all of his cooperation is over. He's about to get his his ultimate sentence. He has been in custody for almost seven years, and then he'll be sentenced, no one knows, anywhere from 10 years to life in prison is the possibility, but often you're given credit for cooperating. So there's a possibility he could get as little as 10 years, and then he served seven, so he could be out in three. There's also the possibility that he could be deported to the Philippines. There's been some talk in court of negotiations with the Philippine government to try to figure out what the consequences for him would be if he were sent back to the Philippines because he is could potentially be charged with murder. He's admitted to seven murders that took place in the Philippines, so he could be charged with murder. He's very afraid of the death penalty being reinstated in the Philippines, so that I think that's his nightmare, is if he gets deported to the Philippines, he's charged with murder, the death penalty gets voted back in, and he gets the death penalty. But there's so many possibilities we won't know until his sentencing happens, which is supposed to happen in July. So uh, is, is the talk that Leroux wants to, to be sent back to the Philippines, or is this um, what his lawyers want or what the DEA wants? I, it's very unclear. There's, there's very sketchy information right now. I would say that I have a very strong assumption that he does not want to be sent back to the Philippines, uh, even though I think he does have both money and, and operations in the Philippines. I think he is rightly afraid that there would be murder charges against him as soon as he, if the moment he arrived in the Philippines. I mean, I spent a lot of time talking to the officers who had investigated the murders that LaRue ordered. And they very much would like to charge him with murder if he comes to the Philippines. You know, the question is, would they have enough evidence to convict him? But my guess is that he would like to avoid that. So uh, I don't know if he can negotiate his way out of that. He's, he's certainly struck uh, good deals for himself in the past. Now, I was just thinking, uh, being the skeptical journalist, if, if he returns to the Philippines, he can pay his way out of prison. <laughs> But well. that's, that's one possibility. But anyway, uh, Ivan, uh, does he still have businesses here in the Philippines? Would you know if everything has been wiped out, all his operations here in Manila? Uh, I know that everything has not been wiped out. I mean, he certainly doesn't have functioning businesses in the same way he did before. I mean, he used to have call centers in Makati and, and elsewhere with hundreds of people working at them. Those are not operational now, I mean, I visited some of the sites where they used to operate, but I have talked to some of his former employees who have seen that there are properties that he still owns and there's activity at those properties. And certainly he has money available to him that is hidden away that no one has confiscated. So I don't know how, uh, how extensive those operations are. I also know that there was someone that he was in prison with, this is sort of a side story, but there was someone he was in prison with here in the US who he arranged to try to restart his businesses in the Philippines. And that person came to the Philippines, uh, was working on the Ruse businesses, and then he himself was arrested for murder and is currently awaiting trial for, for murder in the Philippines. So that may have put a hitch in uh, in LaRue's plans for restarting his businesses. He may have slowed things down, but there's no question that he has plans to restart his businesses there. So there is one uh, mercenary, I mean, there's one of LaRue's mercenaries who's still in the Philippines and is in prison. Is, is that correct? There is one, yes. There's one. He's actually at the, um, at the immigration facility, as far as I know, or at least when I was last was able to visit him when I was there. It, that was 2017, but as far as I know, he is still held in uh, Baikutan. I, I don't know if that's the right pronunciation, but um, he was held there. His name is John Nash uh, at that facility awaiting. They weren't sure how to process him or they were just holding him there, but he he wasn't really facing any charges. He was just being held without, without charge. 
uh, one final question. Even in your book, you talk, you wrote ab um, about the Rub doing business with Iran. Uh, can you walk us through this business with Iran and what did it ever happen? Did he, was he able to uh, supply arms? Was it to Iran? He was. So his his goal was to supply arms to Iran and. Um, you know, it's, again, very difficult to verify because a lot of the information about what he did vis-a-vis -vis Iran comes from him. So it comes from him telling the U.S. authorities as part of his cooperation, oh, here's what I did. And you have to remember that he's trying to get out of his charges. So he's trying to give them the most possible information. So as far as he has told them, he sold a, a, a formula for explosives to the Iranian government for $5 million. And that, that deal did go through. So he had created this explosives formula, he sold it to them, and that was also a kind of down payment on a future um, work that he was doing, designing um, basically missile guidance systems for missiles in Iran. And he had a team of engineers in the Philippines, most of them were Romanian, who were working on that for him. And so, it certainly was in process. That was all happening right when he got arrested. So it's very unclear what progress he really made, whether or not he would have succeeded, whether or not the Iranians truly would have bought it and you know, implemented it in their missiles. But that was certainly the intent, as he has described it, was to create that and sell that to them. Well, thank you so much, Ivan, for, uh, for writing this book. If I can show it to our viewers and... Here's the book, The Mastermind. Actually, it opened my mind to the darker side of my country, the Philippines. Uh, thank you, Ivan, for joining us, and we hope to be in touch with you. And uh, more power to you and your investigative uh, reporting. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Thank you to our viewers, and we hope to do more um, reporting, to follow up on, on the leads or the story that has been written here in The Mastermind. Thank you.